Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Level Up English podcast. Hope you're all doing well. Today we have a special episode, which is actually a member request, or someone requested. I believe someone asked me to do it anyway. But if people do want to suggest episodes for the future, I'm always happy to hear them. I really appreciate it. If you are a member, you can post about it in our private Discord, chat over there, and tell me some ideas for the future, or maybe send me an email. But today we're talking about animals. And it might sound a little bit easy, like, yeah, I know animals, that's not interesting, Michael. But I think I've got an interesting episode today, because I'm going to be talking about different expressions or idioms that you can use in your daily life that involve animals somehow. I'm going to be sharing these idioms, sharing an example from my life of when I did one of these things, and giving you one interesting fact about each animal. So lots of stuff along the way to make it fun today, and I really hope that you do agree. I should also say that if you normally watch, or I should say, if you normally listen to the audio version of the podcast, maybe today, just this once, you should check out the video version and give me some ideas on my background. (laughs) Because for those of you who don't know, this is primarily an audio podcast. I focus mostly on the audio, but I do also post the videos to YouTube. Just type in Level Up English Podcast on YouTube. And if you're here, you will notice I've got some new things in my background. I've got huge, huge cutouts, like as tall as me, of we've got Big Ben and we've got a telephone booth behind me with some nice lighting. And it's a work in progress. I'm still waiting on some other things to arrive in the post to help me spruce up my office. Spruce up means to improve something by adding to it. Make something look better with decoration, perhaps. I need to spruce up the room. However, I do think the room is a little bit too small. It's a very tiny room and these are very big (laughs) cutouts. So maybe it wasn't planned very well, but you'll have to give me your feedback. If you have any ideas on what I could do to make this room look a bit nicer. But anyway, all of that aside, we can get into the topic. Remember though, if you do have any troubles understanding me or following along with my words, then the transcripts might be helpful for you. If you want to see the transcript and read the words as I'm saying them, then you can become a member at levelupenglish.school. There's also a link in the podcast description that you can just tap on and it will take you right to the members page where you can become a member or just find out more if you're interested in that. But okay, we can get into it then. So I have made a list today, it's too much for me to remember, and I have some idioms here. People often request episodes about idioms So this one is for you. This one is for people who want that. And when it comes to animals, there are so many expressions and phrases that we can use. And honestly, I think there are hundreds and hundreds that involve animals in some way. I have only included common ones today. I think that's important to say. If you go online and you type in like a list of idioms, Many of them will be ones that we never really use. You know, maybe I know the meaning, it's just not that common. And if you were to use it, you might sound a bit strange. So this goes for anything in my podcast. I only talk about things that are common, at least in my experience. It may not be common in America, in American English or something, but in my life in the UK, these are common phrases. Let's get into it. So the first one today is to chicken out. This one is not so much an idiom, but more of a a phrasal verb. Chicken out. It can be conjugated, which means changed, just like a regular verb. I chickened out, put an ed on the end. I chickened out. And if you want to say what 
you chickened out of, you would use the word of. I chickened out of the interview. But I should probably tell you what it means, right? So to chicken out is to not do something because you're scared. If you are a chicken, you're scared. I don't know why, but in English, chicken means scared. If someone is too afraid of something, you oh, don't be such a chicken. I don't know where that comes from, but a, a chicken's easily scared. I'm not sure. They seem quite, quite brave to me. You know, they're, they're the ancestors of dinosaurs, aren't they? <laughs> but yeah, if, if you're, say, afraid of doing something, you might chicken out and go, no, I can't do it. I'm going to run away. I'm going to go home. I'm not going to do this. It's a really useful expression that we use in everyday English. And I want to tell you one example now about how I used to chicken out of things all the time. I feel like these days I'm fairly confident. I can I can talk quite confidently, but it wasn't always like that. I used to be very shy indeed. And the worst thing for me was finding a job. That is why I'm so, so happy and lucky to be able to do what I do today, this kind of stuff. Because when I was younger, a teenager and early 20s, I was terrified of meeting new people and trying new jobs. So I would have the time, well, there was a time when I was unemployed and I would have job interviews every now and then. But I would say like 50% of the time, I would chicken out. I remember one time, for example, I cycled, rode my bicycle all the way across the city to go to my job interview. I changed into my nice clothes when I got there. Right as I got to the building, I had second thoughts, which means I had another idea. And I thought, no, I cannot do this. I chickened out and I just went back home. It's just a split decision in that moment. I'm too scared. I cannot do this. There was another one where, very similar thing, I went to the building. Actually, I didn't. I went to the bus. I was going to get the bus to the interview. I went to go get the bus. And then I, right as I was going to get on, I was, "Mm, you know what? I'm just going to go home. I chickened out of that interview. And I, my, um, The person from the job was really mad at me, but I was just so shy and so scared of everything. I chickened out of many things, but I guess it worked out for the best because I'm here today. (laughs) But yeah, let me know. I always like to hear from you. So if you're a member, you can talk about it in our private course page, or you can leave it on the public page, which is levelupenglish.school slash podcast 215. Leave a comment at the bottom and you can answer some questions I give you today. So first of all, tell me something that you have chickened out of before. What have you chickened out of? Okay, it's a good one. Now here's the fact. I did some research about these animals and apparently chickens are able to see many different colours so they see ultraviolet light and iridescent hues. Don't worry too much about the meaning. I'm not too sure what, I'm not too sure how I would describe what that means, honestly. But basically, chickens have very good eyesight in terms of colours and they can see more colours than humans. So we often think of smaller animals having worse eyesight, but apparently chickens have very colourful vision. So that's something I didn't know before, and maybe now you know it as well. (laughs) Okay, here is the next one, and that is to smell fishy. We don't have to use the word smell, we can just say to be fishy. What do you think that means? Hmm, this is fishy, this seems fishy to me. So we are using the word fish, the animal, adding a Y, to make an adjective. Literally, fishy, it is a real word and it just means a kind of fishy smell. So, oh, fishy, that, that smells terrible, fishy smell. You know, I hate the smell of fish, personally. And yeah, in this case, it's 
not so literal. We're not talking about a real smell. If something seems fishy, that means it seems suspicious or maybe a little bit dangerous. The perfect example is like a scam. If someone is trying to scam you, get some money from you, you go, hmm, this seems fishy. It seems like something, maybe there's something you're not being honest with me about. Something a bit suspicious here, right? So an example that I thought of was when I went to Germany, uh, like four years ago, I went to Berlin and there were some people in the street who didn't talk to me, but they had a clipboard and some paper. And at the top it said some petition or something like that. And they handed it to me or they showed it to me and they asked, kind of gestured with their hands if I could sign. And I read about it and it said something about petition for blind people or disabled people or something like that. And at first I was like, oh, what do you want? And then I saw the petition and I just went, nine. Like, no, not interested. No, thank you. <laughs> and I just walked away because I thought, hmm, this smells really fishy. Like, first of all, you have to think, why is this German person or this person approaching me, a foreigner? I guess they, they know that I'm a foreigner for some reason. Why are they asking me and none of the other German people around me? So that was very fishy. That was very suspicious. But honestly, I actually, this is a good travel tip now. Before going to Germany, I had researched common scams in Germany. You can go on YouTube and just type in common scams in this country. So I like to do this whenever I go to a country, I just have a quick look at what are some scams that people have to be careful for. I don't like to be paranoid, but it's really good to know this stuff. One of the scams that I saw was something about a petition for blind people. I don't remember exactly how it works, whether it's distracting you to take your money out of your pocket. I'm, I'm not, I don't remember how it works, but this was something I had heard about before. And as soon as I saw it, it said blind people, I was like, nope, not interested, which is a shame, I guess, because there might be real charities trying to help blind people. I don't know, but I feel like I saved myself on that one. That was very fishy and I avoided it. What is the situation you've been in before where you felt it was very fishy, very suspicious? Hmm. And now my fishy fact for you. This is something I didn't know either, but I actually fact checked it on several different websites because it sounded really fake, but it seems to be true. And this is most fish have taste buds all over their body. Taste bud is what you use on your tongue to taste things. It's how you receive the sensation of taste. And apparently fish have it all over themselves. So I guess that means, you know, if you touch a fish's back, they can taste your finger, maybe? That's very interesting, but I don't know how that would work. Imagine, you know, if you're walking down the street, everything you're standing on, you can taste. That'd be horrible. So. I don't envy them in this case. <laughs> next animal and next idiom. This is a proper idiom now. This is a wild goose chase. A wild goose chase. A goose is a bird. It's like a big duck, basically. It's one of these like big duck-like animals. Very common in, I, I think, London. You get a lot of them in... Uh, what's it called? Maybe not Hyde Park, St. James's Park, I believe. That's the park near Buckingham Palace. You get lots of geese. So this is really important. This is one of the weird words that you don't say gooses. You have one goose, two geese. So the oo changes to e. One goose, two geese. So lots of geese in St. James's Park in London, and they're always, uh, always in the way, always in the way of the path. But a wild goose chase is, you maybe can guess what this means, it's, it's something that's, when you go on a foolish 
search for something that is very hard to find. So imagine literally you have some geese in the wild and you're trying to chase them. They're going to keep running away and flying away. It's going to be really hard to catch them. So a wild goose chase is something that's hard to get. So if you're looking for something and it's taking you many, many hours and it's really difficult, you can say, oh, why am I on this wild goose chase? Or oh, I've been looking for my keys and I've been on this wild goose chase for ages. Right, so whenever you're looking for something that's difficult to find, and maybe you're a little bit silly searching for it because it's unlikely that you'll get it, you can use this idiom. And the example that I thought of, it's a bit of a hard one, but recently I lost my camera lens. I made a video on my, it used to be my main channel, but I'm kind of calling it my second channel now, which is my English with Michael channel. I made a video not long ago where I was in the countryside and I went to a ancient burial chamber, an ancient tomb where people buried our bodies from thousands of years ago, like 5,000 years old. And check it out, by the way, English of Michael on YouTube. But on that walk, I lost my camera lens, the front part of my camera, and I retraced my steps. I walked back to where I went and I was going here. I was running back and forth. I even did some driving. I drove my car to look for it and I could not find it. So I went on a little bit of a wild goose chase trying to find my camera lens and I was cold and tired. It was a bit annoying and I was not successful. So I need to buy a new one. It's going to be you know, 50 pounds maybe, but oh well. So let me know when you have been on a wild goose chase before. The thing I want to share, the fact this time, I found this really interesting so if you have geese in your country, you might know they always fly in a, how can I do it, a, a V shape, a shape of a V, the letter V. So there's one at the front and then they go backwards like a V, like outwards. It's really interesting. And I never knew why they did that, but I researched it and it says there is a good reason. It can increase their flight distance by as much as 71%. So apparently it's a really efficient way to fly. So when the goose in the front gets tired, another goose will take its place. So when the leader gets sleepy, another goose will go to the front and they will, they will go ahead instead. So it's like they're, they're taking in turns. It's really smart that they do that. And then the geese at the back benefit from the airlift. So what this means is, I believe, the geese in front create a kind of a, a tunnel in the wind, right, where it's easier to fly because they're behind the other geese. They're not pushing against all the wind and the air resistance. So the ones at the back have the easiest job. The ones at the front are doing more all of the work. So they keep swapping and, you know, the tired ones go at the back because they have the easiest one. And it's really, really effective for flying long distances. But it's amazing. Anyway, it's a long, long way that they can travel because of that. I don't know how far they can go, but that is an interesting fact. So, okay, let's go to the next one now. We've got a couple more. One of them is butterflies in your stomach. This sounds weird, right? Butterflies in your stomach. This talks about a feeling that you might have. So if you feel like you have butterflies in your stomach, what do you think that is? This is the feeling when you have a mixture of excitement and nervousness. You're excited and nervous before something is going to happen. The perfect example is like a first date. You're meeting a guy or girl, you're going on a date, you're really excited to meet them and maybe they're going to be your future partner. Who knows? Who knows how it's going to go? And you, you've got butterflies. You can say that for short. Oh, I've got butterflies. I'm so excited. You're really excited for this date. 
really useful one uh, for any kind of feeling like this. I had to think about this and I was like, when when do I feel that way? I I haven't had that feeling for a while, which I guess is kind of a shame. It's it's kind of a nice feeling in a way, isn't it? It's like a sign that something big is happening. But I think the last time I really had this was before I went to Portugal. This was summer of 2022. And I always get this feeling before a big trip, I get the butterflies, I'm kind of like excited and nervous, but mostly excited because it's on the precipice of this huge adventure. On the precipice means right before something is about to happen. I'm on the precipice of adventure and I've got butterflies. And I remember I went to Portugal with my friends and we stayed in a hotel by the airport and I, I got there very early and I was just sitting in the the beer garden, the, the, the chairs outside in the sun, drinking a Coca-Cola, thinking about the trip. I was waiting for my friends to arrive. It was the best feeling. Honestly, that time before the trip is sometimes more exciting than the trip itself because you have all that anticipation and, and yeah, the butterflies, right? So let me know, when have you had butterflies in your stomach? Tell me a story about when you felt this nervous, excited feeling. Now for the butterfly fact. So an adult butterfly will emerge from its chrysalis. Chrysalis is the, the thing that caterpillars go into and they, they sleep and they come out as a butterfly, they emerge as a butterfly, but then it doesn't fly away right away. It will sit on the leaf for a few hours and wait for its wings to fill with blood and get dried out. And so it cannot fly right away. And I found this interesting. So I was watching a documentary, which I highly, highly recommend. I've seen two episodes so far. It's narrated by David Attenborough, who is a very famous British narrator. And this is called Life in the Undergrowth. Life in the Undergrowth. And it's all about insects and these tiny, tiny creatures that we often ignore in real life, in day-to-day -day life. And yeah, one of them showed a butterfly. The butterfly burst out of the chrysalis. It was sitting there. And you could see that the wings of the butterfly slowly kind of come up, fill with blood and get ready to fly over a few hours. Really, really fascinating. So if you do see a butterfly sitting on a leaf, leave him alone. He's probably just been born and he's getting ready to fly. Okay. Mm, okay. I tried to finish them all. We're going a bit long, but... Let's have, let's have a longer one today. I hope you, hope you like it. The next one is to pig out. To pig out on something. So this is another phrasal verb. We've got the, the animal pig this time. If you pig out on something, it's you eat too much food in a greedy way. I need to include this because I know it's going to be useful, right? You're going to pig out on something. Everyone pigs out from time to time. I, for example, last week I had a friend come over. We ordered Thai food, which I love. And I don't know how it works where you live, but at least in the UK, you have these plastic containers that contain the food. And I always think, you know, one container is not big enough. It's too small. So I order two, right? But then you put it onto a plate and it's so, it's like a mountain of food. And I, I really ordered too much and it was so good, but I really pigged out and I felt kind of sick afterwards. It was, it was just too much food. So I learned my lesson in the future. I will try to keep my order smaller to get most enjoyment out of my takeaway. <laughs> but yeah, I really pigged out, but I don't, I, I guess I do regret it actually. But let me know 
when was a time you pigged out and how did you feel afterwards? Did you feel regret? Did you feel sick? Or maybe you felt it was worth it. I pigged out and I enjoyed it. Here's the fact for pigs. You may know this, but pigs are actually smarter than dogs. Pigs are very intelligent animals. And it is very hard to say how smart, you know, it's, it's difficult to measure intelligence, but people have estimated that pigs are around the same level of intelligence as a three-year-old human. So think of your little child walking around and you know, trying to read books and stuff like that. A pig is around the same level of intelligence and they have a really good memory as well. So I think that's a really good reason not to use them as food. Pigs are very smart and we should respect them, in my opinion. But yeah, pig out, pig out, pigs, pig out. You know, pigs eat a lot, don't they? I suppose we can maybe end it here, actually. I think in the main, not the main, in the private podcast this week, I want to talk more about animals. And I think it's going to be a really fun one. The private podcast is my bonus podcast feed for members that support me at Level Up English. This comes out every Friday morning and it's a chance for me to get more casual, more personal. You, you get to kind of feel like you're chatting with me in a bit more of a casual way. And this week I want to talk about my own pets. I've had many pets in my life. I want to talk about each one different stories with them, like really funny stories, experiences I've had with animals and maybe that bond between humans and animals. I'm excited for this one. I think it's going to be funny and interesting. and I'd love to hear your pet stories as well. So for now, let's go to a couple reviews on Apple Podcasts. So by the way, the best thing you can do to support me is whatever app you're using, leave a review. I know on Spotify, you have like a, a like button. If you can like it or is it a thumbs up? I'm not sure. That That's so helpful because the more favorites, the more hearts a podcast has, the more people will see it. So if you even like this podcast a little bit, I'd really, really appreciate it. It's just one button from you and it will help me so much, and it will allow the podcast to reach more people. And the reviews on Apple Podcasts work in the same way. The more reviews I have, the more people will see it. And another thing that helps is subscribe. You may be listening and not subscribed. So if you are, click that subscribe button on whatever app you're using, and that will help as well. Little things you can do that will really, really make my day. So, okay. One review from Garda Faisal, who says, I'm from Saudi Arabia. My name is Garda. I have been listening to you for two years and I like your podcast very much. That is amazing, two years. Thank you very, very much. One more here from Tim. And there's about a million numbers after his name. So let's just keep it as Tim, who says, Thank you very much. I do a great job. Tim does a great job. I, I do a great job. I really appreciate you. It's really helpful. Thank you very much, Tim. That's kind. One last one here from Kyoya, Kyoya, who says, hello, I'm from Kuwait. I'm so happy to know your podcast. I hope I can learn more about the British accent. Nice to meet your podcast. Thank you very much. So Garda, Tim and Kyoya, appreciate it. Thank you. And let's end with a quote. I couldn't quite decide on the quote today, but this one was nice. This is from Anatole, Anatole France, who says, until one has loved an animal, part of one's soul remains unawakened. So you have to really love an animal to have that part of your soul awakened. Do you agree? I know maybe not all of you like animals, but 
I, I, I challenge you to try to change your mind, try to find some love for at least one animal in your life. And it's a really special feeling, not something that you can have with a, a human. It's a different thing, isn't it? So let's respect our animal friends who we share the earth with. I think we really owe them a lot and we have a lot to learn from animals in the end. But thank you for listening today. Really appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, everyone. See you later. You have been listening to the Level Up English podcast. If you would like to leave a question to be answered on a future episode, then please go to levelupenglish.school forward slash podcast. That's levelupenglish.school slash podcast. And I'll answer your question on a future episode. Thanks for listening.